Good afternoon, all. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know this, I received my PhD from Vanderbilt University a few years ago. Okay. <laughs> this is the first time I've been back to Nashville. Okay. And a couple of things. Uh, Peabody never looked this good to me when I was here. And two, when I first got the call, I thought the graduate school had found an error in my dissertation. They wanted me to look at it again. But I was assured I was really here to give a presentation. The challenge is that we only have a few minutes to talk, OK? So I tried to think of what kind of theme do I want to get across to you? Um, what, kind of, what message do I want you to take home? Okay? And this is the take home message. This is the theme I'm going to keep repeating. Far better to focus on the positive, skills and competencies, than on the negative, problems or what, are, what is wrong. Some of you probably already believe this, and so it confirms what you already believe um, and the orientation that you do have. If some of you are still thinking about problems and the things that can go wrong, change. Okay? Okay? Because I'm telling you it's better to focus on the positive. Okay? Uh, why? Why? Why is this? Okay, several arguments. Fewer problems don't mean more skills. Okay. Just because a child doesn't have any problems doesn't mean they know how to do anything. Okay. <laughs> uh, we can't make that kind of assumption. These things are not on the same kind of continuum. As you decre decrease problems, you're going to increase competencies and skills. I'm talking about skills and competencies together. I'll give you some more details about more specific things about what I mean. Uh, skills do not automatically develop. They must be taught. Okay. Uh, number three, skills carry more weight in overall adjustment than problems. Okay. There is some evidence that if you try to group kids in terms of the kinds of problems they have, the kinds of skills and competencies they have, if you look, as you start going towards the more positive end of, a, of adjustment, continuum, it's the presence of skills and competencies that makes kids better adjusted, well-adjusted. Even the well-adjusted kids have some difficulties and problems. Okay? And the last issue is more skills can mean fewer problems. Okay? So the reverse can work, and I'll show you some evidence to that sort of an effect. There are some skills that you can promote in children that are incompatible with them having difficulties. If they can do something well, if they know how to do certain kinds of things, they're not going to evince so many behavioral kinds of problems. Okay? Uh, this is not just me talking. The World Health Organization, 1985, came out with their definition of health. And they emphasized it's not merely the absence of problems, okay? disease or disability. It refers to positive functioning in all aspects of development. And they've been trying to promote this. This message has not really caught on very well in the United States, by the way. Okay? Uh, but the Surgeon General made the statement that promoting social, emotional, and behavioral well-being, it's an integral part of children's adjustment. We need to be concerned about this. We need to make concerted efforts about doing these kinds of things. Now, some of you have probably heard these kinds of terms. Um, there's all kinds of different groups, there's all kinds of different movements that have tried to do this, okay? It's called positive psychology, it's called positive youth development, uh, emotional intelligence, character education, social and emotional learning. I'm going to be talking about social and emotional learning, okay? But there's a lot of different groups that are movements that have now tried to focus on the positive, make concerted efforts to help kids flourish, help teens flourish, help adults even flourish. Um, the Department of Labor, okay, did some committee work, and they were trying to come up with what knowledge, skills, and attitudes do we want kids to possess, okay, to be ready to thrive in the 21st century, okay? How do we need to prepare kids? What kinds of things do they need? They came up with a big list, but half of them have to do, in one way or another, uh, with social, emotional competencies or skills, okay? And this is a list of some, the ones that they identified. Uh, again, people use slightly different terms for some of these kinds of things. But there's, again, there's a lot of agreement from different groups that this positive end of adjustment is very, very important. Now, what is social emotional learning? It's defined this way. Uh, processes through which youth and adults develop fundamental personal and social competencies. 
to understand and manage emotions and behavior, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. Now, I don't think there's anybody in this room that would say these aren't good things. <laughs> okay. Uh, however, I did emphasize adults in red, because when I put this list up, people immediately recognize that they've been in relationships and their partners need social and emotional learning. <laughs> uh, some of those relationships have resulted in marriages and the, one of them is stuck, okay. But if their partner could only express themselves more appropriately and communicate and set goals, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think that this is appropriate for everybody during the lifespan, not just children. The five competencies that Castle emphasizes, this gets into a little bit more of the specifics in terms of what kind of things we're talking about. Self-awareness, okay. self-management, self-social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Those are the five domains that they keep emphasizing. And of course, there are different kinds of skills within each of those domains. Uh, and they are overlapping because they do relate. Okay. So it's hard to be socially aware if you're not self-aware. It's hard to be socially aware and self-aware if you don't manage your things very well. But these are the kinds of domains that appear in a lot of social and emotional learning programs. Some of these programs are comprehensive and trying to target all of these areas. Some of the programs just focus on one or two of these domains. Uh, in terms of self-management, here's more of a breakdown in terms of what we're talking about. Impulse control, self-management, these kinds of things. Okay. Uh, these would be good things for kids to have, right? Can children learn these kinds of skills? Okay. And I would not be here if the answer is no. <laughs> okay. Well, watch this. Watch this. I did that. I did that myself. So let me repeat that so the message gets through. And that's what I want to talk to you about. There are all kinds of programs now that attempt to promote different kinds of skills and competencies in kids. Okay. Uh, and we can do it. <laughs> okay. uh, di different programs work, and they work in different kinds of ways. Now, Dale was very nice to make some positive comments about the review we did, uh, and I thank you for that. I know many of you have read our, read our review and have liked it, and I thank you for that. I know some of you take the review to bed with you and put it under your pillow. And I do appreciate that, okay? <laughs> However, I would suggest, instead of the review, a stuffed animal or a human being, okay? <laughs> the review is just going to keep you up at night. The stuffed animal will help you sleep. The human being might interfere with your sleep, but other positive things could happen. <laughs> uh, but I'm just going to go through briefly, you know, what we did. We did a, a review of a lot of programs. There were a lot of programs out there when we did this, okay? A lot of kids involved. A uh, nice spectrum in terms of where the schools were located, urban, suburban, rural kinds of areas. And a lot of uh, variability in terms of the diversity of their student body, okay? Both Sandra and Denise are talking about how diverse schools are, okay? So we had a good sample that way. Uh, now, here's our report card. See how cute this is? See, I'm talking about school-based intervention, and I'm now going to give you the report card on school-based intervention. These are, so we're looking at children who have participated in social-emotional learning programs in comparison to kids who have not. Okay, so there's a control group somewhere. Okay. Sometimes we can't always tell what the control group is really getting, but anyway, they're not getting the same kind of program, hopefully. And we looked at these kinds of results, because these were the results that were appearing most frequently in the evaluations. Um, there, were, there was a difference in social skills, social and emotional ki skills. The kids were learning these skills, and they did better on them than the control group did. That's not a big deal, okay, because that's what the programs are targeting. There was also a change in attitudes towards self and others, okay, feelings of self-confidence and self-efficacy, uh, and even feelings about school bonding that Denise was talking about, okay? Feeling more connected to the school, safer at school, liking teachers or students more. Uh, these are nice things, but what else can you get from promoting the positive, okay? Did we get a positive effect on positive social behaviors? Yes, we did. The kids in these programs were showing more positive behaviors at the end of the program than the control kids were, 
Uh, now, the other two areas here, problem behaviors, what happens? The level of problem behaviors also went down in the kids who were in the SEL programs. Okay. Uh, the level of their emotional distress also went down among the kids in the SEL program. So not only were the kids learning skills, okay, their attitudes were changing, but we were seeing decreased levels of problem behaviors and emotional distress. The emotional distress mainly had to do with things like anxiety and depression. It was pretty common in kids. Uh, the big finding that everybody seemed to love is that there was also a positive difference in terms of academic achievement. Okay. A lot of schools worry, oh no, we got another program we've got to bring in, and we've got all this testing, and it's going to interfere, and what does this have to do with school, and all this sort of stuff. I think these results show that it very much has to do with school, and it can help kids. Okay. We don't know, I'm not going to talk about the limitations of this review, because I want to focus on the positive. Remember the take-home message, okay. <laughs> Another issue that comes up is, oh, first of all, our findings were not affected by the, where the school was located, urban, suburban, or rural, or the ethnic racial characteristics of the kids in the school. Now, this kind of finding suggests that these kinds of programs can probably work in a lot of different schools. Okay. Most all of these schools are based in the United States, although recently, over the past few years, there's been a lot more work done uh, in other countries outside the United States. They've picked up either on these findings done in, in the States or have done their own kinds of programs. So Australia has programs, Great Britain has a lot of programs. Um, it is catching on elsewhere. Uh, we also had a subsample where we looked at whether or not the results of these programs last over time, which is a big issue. Okay. Um, you get positive effects right at the end of the intervention. We were able to identify at least 49 interventions okay, that had a follow-up at least six months or more. Some of, them are, some of them have gone on more than that. And we looked at these outcomes again. We also added drug use because now that the kids were older, they, were, they could be getting into drugs. And there were more evaluations that looked at that as follow-up. So we might be talking about an early elementary school thing that follows the kids into middle school. Okay. Um, the other good thing about a six-month follow-up is for most all of these kinds of programs, it means the kids were in the next grade and had different teachers, okay. which is good because you get a different report from another adult. Uh, positive results. Okay. Still got positive results on skills, attitudes, social behaviors, problem behaviors, emotional distress, and what happened with academic achievement. Still there? Oh, come on, of course it's still there. <laughs> I would have skipped it from the slide if it wasn't there. We also got a positive effect on drug use, okay? Uh, now, since this review, we're extending our review because there have been mo now more follow-up studies that have appeared within the last few years. So I think we're going to probably add maybe 20 or 25 more programs that have done at least a six-month follow-up. Uh, there are some folks that have done long, long-term follow-up of their group. And one of the most famous ones is the uh, Seattle Social Development Program. And they've been able to track about 90% of their, the kids in the program plus control groups over time. And they're getting like really good results on a lot of things. And these are really important social impact outcomes, okay? Graduation rates, college attendance, employment, mental health kinds of things, fewer with criminal record or child abuse. Now, not everybody does these long-term studies, but um, there's more now that have been able to track over time and are showing results um, on very important social kinds of indicators. Um, what's the rub here? Okay, <laughs> These programs, you can't just read a book or a manual and do them. You really need professional development and assistance. You need careful training, and then you need some follow-up technical assistance, coaching, and more training afterwards. And there are groups that will provide this assist assistance and training. Okay? Not for every program, so you don't have all kinds of options, but schools do have options in terms of which kinds of programs they might choose or, or you know, try to implement. So have, they have some choice. Um, uh, there's, a big, there, and there's a big issue now in terms of this whole issue about disseminating and implementing evidence-based programs. How can you do this most effectively? And it's pretty clear, okay, you need some sort of 
professional development. You need some kind of training and assistance. Every school district's a little bit different. There's different kinds of issues to work out or whatever. Uh, CASEL, uh, who I consult for, has a list of these kinds of consultants that are willing to, to come out. It costs money. Nothing's free, right? So the schools have to budget for this, okay? But of course, over time, the costs go down if you can f train up your staff. Okay. Then they're going to continue the kinds of programs. And there are now a lot of examples of programs that have continued uh, over time after the evaluation and have really become institutionalized because that's another big issue. Sometimes programs start, sometimes they might even do well, but for one reason or another they go away. Okay. Administrators change or the staff changes or the times change or whatever. Um, so it's become a big issue around the country, around the world, in terms of, okay, if you even have an evidence-based program, if you can even get it into a school, will it really stay in the school? Is it going to stay long-term in the school? For the kids' benefits, we need it to stay long-term so they continually get exposed. Uh, this is the reference for the review that Dale mentioned, uh, the website for CASEL. Remember the take-home message? You didn't forget the take-home message, did you? Far better to focus on the positive than on the negative, okay? Uh, and so I hope, I hope you go home with this message. It'll change your life. <laughs> it will change your life, really. Uh, thank you very much.